And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the very busy intersection and hot intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck here coming to you from the mothership. You can email your questions to Spitzer's Universe, all one word at EW10.com. Check out Father Spitzer's Magic Center website as well as CredibleCatholic.com for all things Spitzerian. And of course, the show is always available on EWTN On Demand and on EWTN YouTube. So if you missed any part of it or you'd just like to see it again, uh, or you want to catch up on some of the things Father Spitzer was talking about, sometimes it takes a second listen, uh, you can check it out online. So, uh, And of course, our topic is Jesus' defeat of Satan in the temptations in the desert. We're finally going to get through that as part of Father's wonderful book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, available naturally through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com for all things Catholic. Speaking of Catholic books and the book of the month published by EWTN Proudly is Living the Scriptures by Mother Angelica. This is based on her wonderful, wonderful program that aired for many years here on EWTN. Living the Scriptures now in book form. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Look for an interview I did with Father Joseph on it as well. You can see that coming up soon and even on demand that bookmark. That being said, let's uh, move on to the West Coast and Father Spitzer and welcome him once more and ask him to welcome us through uh, a prayer. Absolutely. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this ministry and the blessings of our lives once again because you are so generous and you give us so much, you direct us through your Holy Spirit. We ask you that you send that same Spirit down upon us now to inspire, guide, and protect us so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your church, your people, and your kingdom through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray Amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, good to see you, Father. And, of course, uh, following up on uh, some of the things going on in the last couple of weeks, uh, another article I read recently, uh, Rob Royal, Robert Royal put out, uh, yep. uh, having mm -hmm. to do with some of the politics going on. And he really referred to some of these things going on in the country as our American Catholic Rubicon. Um, to think in terms mm -hmm. of uh, Caesar. Uh, but mm -hmm. he, here's yep. a quote I thought was really something for us to think about. I wanted to get your reaction. He said, to allow leaders at the highest levels of government now who call themselves Catholic to continue to vigorously promote abortion, f as he, and he brackets, forget the personally opposed days that have gone by, mm -hmm. homosexuality and curbs on religious liberty mean that we that what little public influence the church still retains is on a fast track to oblivion. We're in peril of crossing a line after which the faith will be under attack, not only by an aggressive world with a wholly different understanding of what it means to be human, but by wayward Catholics themselves. Your thoughts? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, truth to it. I think if you don't draw the line somewhere, if you permit a huge gray area in an, air, in, a, in an issue which is purportedly black and white, then you give all the wrong signals. And what he's trying to say is, we are creating the gray area ourselves by our lack of clarity, by our lack of certainty about what is, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, at least uh, permissible politically. And so we have to speak very strongly about this. And I think in the long run, uh, uh, if we don't speak strongly about this, if we, if we don't uh, make it a black and white issue, which it is, then uh, at the end of the day, we're going to, we're going to suffer from creating the gray area ourselves, and we will fall right into it and uh, mislead uh, so many mm -hmm. Catholics along with it. So I, I completely agree with him. Right, and I think that's the big part that uh, for uh, people to keep in mind, the, the concept of giving scandal or the fact uh, of kind of like when we were kids, you, you know, your, you know uh, your mother would say to you, well, what are you doing over there? Bob, and you, you know, you sure you should be doing it? You say, well, Dad saw me. He didn't say anything. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> exactly. Right. So you already you've got the lever to right, justify. Right, 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 right. Exactly. No. So that's, no, it's pretty good. Right. That's <laughs> I agree. Right. Where, where we are here. Let's get to uh, some questions and catch up on some questions people have sent sure. us. Sure. Um, Dear Father Spitzer, what is the purpose of the homily? I was told it was to simply explain the readings of the day, 
But at the parish I attend, the priest uses it as a teaching moment explaining various church doctrines. I wonder what parish that is. I might want to go. These homilies have yeah. enlightened me and given me a deeper appreciation of the Mass and our faith. But is the priest overstepping the limits of the homily, Mike? No, Mike, I think he's not. I, I think um, normally a homily should start off uh, with giving an explanation of the, uh, of the scriptures, but it's perfectly appropriate for a priest to move from an explanation of what's going on in the scripture passages of the day and just say, well, look, this is illustrated in this doctrine, and mm -hmm. here's how this doctrine evolved. And you can see that it's an extension of trying to explain this issue that came up with Jesus in today's scripture or what St. Paul says in today's scripture. And so I think it's perfectly appropriate. You don't have to sit, stick with only the scriptures. What the objective is, is to explain the scriptures to people. They can get the sort of historical context. What is the, the deeper meaning for their lives? And in order to explicate that deeper meaning in their lives, it's perfectly appropriate to talk about church doctrines. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just skip the scriptures altogether, mm -hmm. Uh, well, that might not be appropriate because uh, obviously the, the objective is to elucidate the, the Word of God. But boy, I talk about not only script, you know, I, I do talk about the scripture, but of course I launch into things that have to do with his, church history, with doctrine, with, well, faith and science, if it's appropriate, anything that will yeah. illustrate the topic and then get to the main point of how do you apply this to your life. Um, you know, how do I apply mm. it to my life? Those kinds of things, I think, are perfectly appropriate right. for homily. Right, yeah, better than reading a Peanuts cartoon from 1968, uh, yeah. which many of us suffered through <laughs> as, an, uh, as a homily. Uh, next yeah. up, uh, yeah. for those old enough to recall, uh, Dear Father yeah. Spitzer, I'm good. We're, we're, I am glad we are returning to person masses, in person masses in our parishes. Mm -hmm. Before the pandemic, many people came to mass casually dressed. Now, as we return, things seem to have even gotten worse. This upsets me as I was taught to wear my Sunday best to honor the Lord. What is your opinion on this, Joyce? Well, Joyce, I've always been of the opinion that um, wearing your Sunday best is the best way to go, or at least wearing um, a, a good clothes, respectful clothes. I, I think, um, you know, coming in shorts or something of that nature is um, not my protocol for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, if, if I could maybe draw a person in who's like a younger person mm -hmm. uh, so that they can learn a more um, respectful protocol, um, you know, I wouldn't reject a person wearing shorts. Mm. I would encourage a person who is wearing shorts, uh, you know, hey, you know, this is really the presence of Jesus. This is really going to be the sacrament that, mm -hmm. that Jesus provided for us. We're being invited to his feast here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a feast that leads to eternal salvation. We're talking about being the guest of God here. Mm -hmm. So we really want to be respectful when we come in. But again, I'm not in favor of rejecting people who right. don't meet the standard, uh, but I do think we should encourage people who are not meeting that standard uh, to maybe look at this anew, that this is really, uh, you know, not just a, a social community uh, around us. This is not just a, a gathering to hear, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the Word of God and, and, and the uh, and uh, have the priest homily, but this is really the mm -hmm. banquet of Jesus Christ himself that he gave us, and so we are definitely in the presence of God in his word, and the presence of God, especially mm -hmm. in the Holy Eucharist that is present. Right. So that's probably how I would work it. Well, it seems like, you know, we end up with uh, this kind of idea that we take the idea that yes, there are exceptions and we want to be open to those people who maybe don't know better. It becomes the, well, we have to be open to everybody doing it that way. Otherwise, yeah. somehow, you know, like you said, and the other, mm -hmm. other idea is to say, yes, you're welcome, but there are actually standards that maybe you should be aware yeah. of. Uh, yeah, and I yeah. think somebody used to say, they said, well, what, would you go dress like that? if you were going to be in front of the president or the pope yeah, yeah. or some yeah, other exactly. important figure or the or the president or the chairman of your giant company would you show up like that then why would you do it mm -hmm. with uh, 
created the universe, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's precisely the point. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I generally find encouragement works uh, best mm -hmm. and to give an explanation like you just gave, an analogy that you just gave, that that's the perfect way to do it uh, without, of course, uh, clubbing a person or rejecting right. a person. Right. And um, so, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I agree. I right. think it's a perfectly good way to approach it. Okay, next up, Dear Father Spitzer. Now, I've heard that the main reason we go to Mass is to offer sacrifice. We are only obligated to receive communion once a year, but we must attend Mass every week. Is there any truth to that? I truly enjoy your show, Zach. Well, Zach, I mean, um, uh, the priest is offering sacrifice. There is no question about that. But the reason that we go to church uh, first and foremost is we do want to receive the Lord into us because when we receive the Lord into us in Holy Communion uh, he begins to transform our hearts he begins to you know instruct us from within he begins to give us and infuse into us his peace he's breaking the grip of Satan uh, you know over us especially in the forgiveness of our venial sins uh, he's the one that's leading us to eternal salvation so first and foremost the reason we're going to mass is because we want to receive the Lord um, and so the, the idea of well you only have to receive communion once a year or you know this is like a tangential element mm -hmm. the sacrifice is the most important thing mm -hmm. actually the reception of our Lord is the most important thing uh, for sure now of course you get there's a, other reasons for going to mass uh, if, if you're uh, for example if you maybe have committed a mortal sin and and you can't receive communion uh, or, or something of that nature okay mm. um, well um, yes of course it's it's important to be at the mass because of the sacrifice which is taking place there uh, no question about it it's important to go to mass because of all the different kinds of prayers that are offered at the mass so there's prayers for forgiveness mm -hmm. there's prayers of praise and glory there's all kinds of prayers that are uh, you know prayers of petition things of that nature there are also prayers where we're actually um, you know asking the Lord to transform our hearts uh, so there are all kinds of different prayers that are going on and we're brought into a kind of contemplative experience through the Mass and so that's a, you know another reason mm -hmm. uh, for going to Mass and, and, and of course when we go to Mass too we listen to the Word of God and when we listen to the Word of God uh, clearly th there's things there the Holy Spirit is trying to move that priest to move us and the Holy Spirit is working in us to be moved uh, by what's mm -hmm. in the Word and what's in the homily uh, so that we might be able to better apply uh, Christ's teaching within our own lives. So there's many, many reasons for going to Mass, but primary among them is the reception of the Lord because that's where the miracle mm -hmm. uh, really starts taking place par excellence. Right. Right. But yes, we also want to be part of that contemplative experience in prayer. We also want to be part of the community who's praying. We also want to be learning from the Word of God and from the homily where that helps us to apply the Word of God mm -hmm. to our lives right now. All of those things are uh, really relevant uh, to being there. So all in all, right. definitely you want to go, uh, but of course, definitely right. you want to receive uh, yeah. Holy Communion. I mean, some this minimalist looking at it. Sometimes you have the with the church trying to be not requiring any more than is absolutely necessary. You know, once a year communion or once mm -hmm. a year confession kind of a thing. It reminds mm -hmm. me of this book that was out years ago called You Know What's the Least You Can Do or Believe and Still Be a Good Catholic. I mean, that's not really you know the idea <laughs> was that it really important. Right, it was similar to that. If I paraphrase it, I guess. Yeah. But that was the sense yeah. of the book. So it's, it's this idea yeah. like, well, yeah, that, that's, that said, you know, that's the minimum. The, but you, like you yeah. said, you really want to do much more than that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Right. I mean, uh, obviously our whole objective is to get to heaven and to lead a lot of people into heaven mm -hmm. along with us. And, and the objective there is to purify our hearts, purify our love, so that we really mm -hmm. are uh, you know, in our actions, manifesting the quality of love that Jesus Christ manifested and the truth that he manifested. And so uh, that's, that's our objective um, in, in uh, 
in, in doing that, and we want every single bit of it that we can get right, right now. I mean, if we don't purify our hearts now, we're going to do it in the next life in purgatory. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake about it. I, I don't see how you'd be able to get out of it um, because we won't be fit to enter into the kingdom of heaven until our hearts have been purified, which has to be done with the cooperation of our free choice. Absolutely. So all of those things, uh, you know, put mm -hmm. into perspective, you know, we, we, uh, we want to do everything that we can to get into heaven now and lead other people into heaven as best we can to cooperate with the Lord in every way that we can. And uh, obviously, many of us have had some pretty deep hardships in our lives. There are a lot of things that, mm -hmm. you know, we have habits and propensities, even sinful habits and propensities are difficult to get over. But the more we struggle and the more we work at it, the, I'm telling you, the better off we're going to be mm -hmm and the more good we're going to do in this world as we're getting into the kingdom of heaven. Very good. Dear Father Spitzer, how can I convince someone about the existence of the spiritual world and the great battle being waged for souls? Some people look only for quote unquote cold hard facts. How can I point out the presence and work of Satan and his followers without coming across as a religious fanatic, which turns so many people off? Martha. Uh, Martha, I, um, first of all, I, you know, I would start before you get into the spiritual battle, I would start off by talking about how to follow the inspirations of, of the Holy Spirit. So that's the, the first thing that people really do recognize, that God does communicate with us. And so the, the, the first thing to do is always begin, like in this book we're going through right now, mm -hmm. Christ versus Satan in our daily lives, the first thing is take a look at that chapter one, the whole first part of it, which talks about how the Holy Spirit works. How does he inspire us? How does he communicate with us? Okay, he communicates with us by these little thoughts in the back of our mind. And I've got another book that's out already. It's called Escape from Evil's Darkness. It goes through all of these things, all the ways God communicates with us mm -hmm. in chapter 3. But let me just start there. The, you know, he communicates with us these little thoughts in the back of our mind. He uses things called consolations and desolations. These are deep feelings. Mm -hmm. If it's a desolation, it's a deep feeling of emptiness and alienation, and loneliness and mm -hmm. dread. If it's consolation, it's a deep sense of peace or being in communion with God, a, a sense of being held in higher purpose with the Lord. And we can actually sense these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, th there are real changes in our lives that take place when we're in a state of consolation versus a state of desolation. But these are used, make no mistake about it, by the Holy Spirit to guide us and inspire us to, and to help us. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we're kind of moving in a direction that's not so good, and wham, all of a sudden we get an increase in alienation and dread and loneliness, and we go, whoa, whoa wait a minute, what's going on here? Or we get a sense of the presence of evil, and all of it's you know, just vacuous sucking out of all the love in us, you know, and we get the, you know, just this sense of being horribly alone okay uh, is maybe we're on the wrong path there somewhere um, and and the Holy Spirit's really trying to lead us and trying to tell us Spitzer don't do this you know mm -hmm. go in the opposite direction alternatively sometimes uh, we have this sense of real inspiration where things are just coming to us one thing after the next and and uh, we, we feel a sense of real peace and communion with God and and you just you, sometimes we can even feel that sense of joy mm -hmm. and almost ecstatic love and unity um, that, that is on a higher level of consolation or maybe even just a stab of joy as uh, C.S. Lewis would mm -hmm. call it or uh, you know that sense of you know consolation without previous cause as St. Ignatius would call it. So all these things there are other ways that the Holy Spirit guides us and then God also guides us through what I call conspiracies of divine providence in our lives mm -hmm. where all of a sudden we just see that we're blocked on every turn every time we turn around and finally you start saying hmm let me ask this question Lord are you trying to tell me something modulate my behavior will put move me in a different direction what's going on here mm -hmm. now sometimes the cross is just the cross and sometimes getting blocked is just getting blocked but sometimes it's like block, 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 mm -hmm. until finally I go, okay, 
all right, Lord, what are you trying to tell me here? Uh, should I be trying to do the hurdles here, or should I be uh, modulating something uh, here? And that wow. question for discernment is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And then there are all kinds of rules for the discernment of spirits. So these things also are very important. Uh, and I discuss those um, in chapter four of this book, Christ versus Satan in our daily lives. Right. So uh, um, all things being um, you know, considered, mm -hmm. uh, God does really help us there. But go through chapter one of this book, Christ versus Satan, and you can see all of those uh, different um, ways in which God communicates with us. Start there. Mm -hmm. And then after you've done that, then maybe move to chapter three of this book mm -hmm. where I talk about those two possession mm -hmm. cases, the possession of Robbie Mannheim that led to that book, The Exorcist, that was a very real exorcism, and then also the possession of Julia, the satanic high priestess uh, who goes to Dr. Richard Gallagher, um, you know, and, uh, and works, uh, he was present at her exorcism mm -hmm. and worked with her uh, he, he wasn't the exorcist, right. he was the psychiatric uh, um, doctor present there, but the, the point right. is that um, well, um, right. I, think uh, I would probably go through. Right. Mm -hmm. I would highly recommend actually that they go to E.W. Tins Religious Catalog and buy your book Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives and maybe <laughs> give it to this person uh, <laughs> yeah. and tell them the tool through there it and take go. a look at it as well and uh, get some yeah. more information as well as your mm -hmm. your second book which is also out which we'll be talking about yeah. in the near future as well let's move ahead sure. to another question dear father spitzer you recently discussed the obedience of a priest to his bishop bishops are currently discussing this was like basically last week but it's ongoing uh, whether to give mm -hmm. communion to politicians who support abortion if an individual uh -huh. bishop decides that giving communion to that politician is acceptable does the parish priest have the right to refuse communion if the politician comes to his, I guess, parish or parish church, Cassie? Well, Cassie, um, here is what I would say. Um, even if a particular bishop says uh, that he, he, he's going to go to communion, that priest ought to go back to that bishop and ask, if that man comes to my parish, may I refuse Holy Communion uh, to him. Mm -hmm. So I would always recommend that a priest get the permission of his bishop before he uh, refuses communion to a politician. Make sure the bishop is informed that uh, there's commensurability there, uh, et cetera. So um, yes, I, I think you know that, that would be the, the main thing. Now, would a bishop uh, order a priest uh, not to follow um, the guidelines of the USCCB. Uh, if he did, mm -hmm. uh, that priest would have a right of appeal mm -hmm. uh, to the USCCB and just say, you know, uh, I, I tried to follow the guidelines and right. I've been refused. Uh, do I have a right of appeal? So I would try and do this within the framework of the church's juridical structure, which is always the best way to proceed. It is not a good way to proceed uh, to just kind of ramp, just disobey and just, right, you right. know, just say, well, I've got a right, you know, this is my interpretation right. of the USCCB um, uh, directive, and so I, I'm going to do this on my own. That's always a bad way to proceed. Yeah, freelancing so, yeah, um, is not a good idea, yeah. usually, with these things. Yeah, exactly. But I, I guess you could also be in a situation where the priest might inform the bishop and say, listen, in good my conscience, I've examined it. I, I couldn't do this, so... I just don't, mm -hmm. you know, whatever I can be done not to be put in that position, uh, I don't want to yeah. be in that position. Yeah. So, right. That's right. Uh, yeah, against my conscience. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That, that's you could absolutely do that, and uh, also you could probably, like I said, there's there's uh, you know once the bishop is acting against mm -hmm. a directive from uh, the USCCB, mm -hmm. there is a right of appeal for that priest. Right. I think the big thing too with a lot of this is has less to do with the let's embarrass somebody who's trying to receive communion is to put people on notice if they're not aware yeah. uh, in public yeah. aware that Ab absolutely. these positions they're taking are are not in conjunction uh, you know they're anti the church's position and they should not present mm -hmm. themselves for communion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they shouldn't put the priest uh, yeah. 
or the you know the parish in that position of having to try or to themselves them. right, right yeah or right. themselves right yeah. and they and yeah. they have to realize that if you know they might fool everybody else but God knows what's in their heart so they're gonna have to answer yeah. for that one day mm -hmm. which I think too many yeah. people don't really believe that anymore I think they kind of yeah. don't think that conversation is <laughs> about gonna happen uh, here's another question. Yeah, if it floats with the American people, <laughs> it'll float with God. Right, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. This, listen, I rationalized it. Uh, we'll have a nice conversation. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I know someone who, uh, who had a, an experience um, of, in a sense of uh, having died or appearing and was face to face with the Lord in their mind at least. And their whole point was, you don't say anything. He just knows. And there's no, yeah. <laughs> like, let me explain this, Lord. Yeah. Uh, so oh, it was, yeah. it was yeah. an interesting uh, thing that I keep in the back of my mind. Dear Father Spitzer, right. I go to confession. I receive the Holy Eucharist every Saturday. I'd like to attend Sunday Mass as well, but confession is not offered in my church on Sunday. I have a problem with impure thoughts, and I'm afraid I will not be worthy to receive the Eucharist. Am I right in thinking that impure thoughts are mortal sins, Bob? And this now we're on the other end of the uh, kind of the extreme yeah. end of the other oh. part where people are being overly yeah. scrupulous. So. That's right. Well, Bob, well, we got to go back just to the church's teaching. There are lots of impure thoughts that are not mortal sins, and there are lots of impure thoughts that that might be mortal sins. Uh, the main thing we have to take a look at is. Okay, first of all, are you kind of entertaining those impure thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, number two, uh, are you doing this with um, full consent of the will? Remember that every mortal sin has to be done uh, with sufficient knowledge, and obviously you have sufficient knowledge, but also with full consent of the will. That is to say, no impediments to the free use of the will. So sometimes, you know, <laughs> these... Uh, uh, impure thoughts, they come right into your mind. And, um, and, and when they come into your mind, you know, it, it, it's, it's not easy sometimes to instantaneously turn them off. So you're already entertaining them uh, before you even know what's happening. So the point is, is when do you kind of cross that line of where you're entertaining the thought um, and, you know, you know, I could turn this thought off now. But I kind of like it, so I'm going to stick with it. Mm -hmm. And you know that that thought is germinating kinds of, you know, beha behaviors. In other words, it's going to move you further along uh, the pike to doing something uh, that acts on that thought in some way, either uh, in you know by yourself or with another person or whatever the the case may be. So the the main thing that you want to do is is pretty much try to stop right at that juncture where you are now at the near occasion of sin. Mm -hmm. You could stop it. You know you could stop it. You like it, and you know that it could lead you uh, into a further conduct that would be really disobedient to the Lord, and, and you just go ahead and do it anyway. That's where you're kind of getting into the problem. That's where you want to stop things, um, you know, it, you know, uh, before you know they can stop and you just say okay I'm stopping this right now and um, by and large uh, you know sometimes it works on the first try sometimes you kind of have to stop it repeatedly two or three different times because it keeps going back into your mind and, and, and you just have to keep stopping it again but eventually if you do that mm -hmm. you, you know you're going to get to the point where you just go oh I'm sorry Lord you know what I mean? You, 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 first, you're kind of you're trying to stop it, and you're kind of inside yourself. But then, once you get to that point where, you, like, the second time or third time, you finally go, "Oh Lord, I'm sorry. I, I know what I'm doing here. I don't want to disappoint you, and I, I don't want to get myself any further down this line. And I'm sorry I gave way as much as I did. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've done your job. The minute you, you know that happens, generally, the spell." of this, you know, thought, it, it just, it dissipates right then when you just get that reflexive act and pray to God and you go, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to do this. I, I don't want to disobey you. I don't want to be in this situation, you know, and you, you just, then you stop it. 
So that that's mm -hmm. best advice I can give you there, Bob. Right. Um, you know, but uh, not no. All impure thoughts are not mortal right. sins by any stretch of the imagination. And I, I think you we kind of have to go down. Encourage the pipe Bob for a while. to go to mass on Sunday and not worry about. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Sorry, that was a big about, question. You know, please, <laughs> yeah, please go to mass on Sunday. You might find yes, if you do that absolutely. more. Uh, Maybe you'll ha have less of those showing up as well. You can use one of yeah. Father Spitzer's, uh, you know, quickie prayers there to drive the devil away. You yeah. Know, so. Yeah, ex absolutely. They right. they very much do work in absolutely. the name of Jesus. Be gone, Satan. Right. Uh, that's always a good one. Or Saint Michael, just help me here. Drive right. that uh, demon away. Absolutely. absolutely. Very good. We'll take a break. Much more ahead, of course, with Father Spitzer and your questions as we continue. And we do appreciate you staying with us as we continue here on Father Spitzer's Universe. Our topic, Jesus' Defeat of Satan and the Temptations in the Desert, from Father's wonderful book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, and of course available through our EWTN Religious Catalog. Let's continue on with some questions that we've gotten over the last couple of weeks that we never got around to. Dear Father Spitzer, my sister, a fallen away Catholic, recently became, actually came upon a book on Holy Communion that really impressed her. The book is written by the pastor of an independent church, so it's not Catholic. It stresses the need to oh. receive communion frequently, that's interesting, but focuses on physical benefits while excluding the spiritual ones. Is there a good book that explains Holy Communion from a Catholic perspective that would be easy for the lay person to understand? This is Mary. That's a real odd mix there, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mary, I, I wrote a book, if I might be self-promoting. So uh, bold. Called Five Pillars. <laughs> <laughs> so bold, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's called Five Pillars of the Spiritual Life, and Chapter 1 uh, does concern uh, the Holy Eucharist and precisely, um, you know, the idea uh, not only of uh, the real presence of Jesus mm -hmm. in the Holy Eucharist, uh, but the spiritual benefits. So if you just go to the last part of that chapter on the five graces of Holy Communion, they're spiritual graces. They're not about physical healings and things of that nature. And I would always mm -hmm. say that even if sometimes a person does seem to have the truth, if they're out of communion mm -hmm. with the Catholic Church, that's probably not the text to be <laughs> reading. Uh, the, it's probably better to go for something, uh, you know, where a person is in communion with the church because you really don't know what you're getting. Right. And, and you're, th that person's not under any scrutiny from a higher authority source to be teaching uh, doctrine uh, to commensurate with right. the teaching of Jesus. So um, uh, definitely go to Five Pillars of the Spiritual Life, Chapter 1, and just go toward the end of the chapter and look at those spiritual graces there. I think that's pretty intelligible. Uh, most people think that book is a real uh, accessible Good. book. Good, yeah, especially bizarre, the idea of somehow the Eucharist or whatever they're doing for communion, but it doesn't help you spiritually, it helps you physically. That's right, yeah. using special yeah. you know, hmm. kind of, yeah, uh, very. I don't know, high yeah, fiber something or something. Very, very strange. Yeah, very, yeah. yeah it yeah. doesn't, it's very <laughs> odd. Yeah. Uh, next and, up, uh, dear Father. Well, big, huge uh, error of omission, I might point out. There you yeah. go. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Dear Father Spitzer, most of the Catholic schools where I live have LGBTQ clubs. They don't teach Catholic Church it's just teachings on morality. Is there anything we can do to make Catholic schools teach church teachings on moral issues? With well, if they're not teaching it, I'm, I'm, then they're obviously Catholic in name only. But that does yeah. happen. Yeah, there. Um, right now, I'm actually trying to write a, a whole program for junior year, um, uh, second semester junior year for uh, Catholic uh, high schools, um, and I'm trying to take a new approach to doing it, which I do think will help teachers. I, I think what um, the teachers are up against uh, right now is they don't want um, to alienate um, uh, students by saying, you know, that. Um, that uh, well, homosexual lifestyle has 
uh, a difficulty with it or a darkness uh, that's intrinsic to it um, because they don't have the statistical studies to, to show it. What, in fact, they want to say is, of course the Catholic Church respects all same-sex attracted people. There's no question about that. And, of course, we believe that every same-sex attracted person has the uniquely good and lovable, mysterious, transcendent soul and spirit, right? We, we believe this the same as any heterosexual uh, person. So the, the, the point there is we have to do two things. Number one, we have to make the distinction between the person and the lifestyle. And then secondly, we should tell the truth about the lifestyle. So, for example, I think, you know, again, I've, I've prepared, I'm preparing this, correct, this program for junior year um, uh, 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 teachers because I think you can justifiably say to students, look, if you go into this lifestyle, Let's skip the fact that a person is same-sex attracted or not. Don't even consider it. Just if you pursue this lifestyle, you go into the gay lifestyle, what can you expect to find? You can expect to find seven times the rate of the contemplation of suicide. You can expect to find a depression rate that's three to 3.5 times higher. Uh, you can expect to find similar uh, increases in the, in the rate of anxiety, similar in panic disorders, and also uh, a similar rate of increase in substance abuse, uh, along with a variety of other real, you know, terrible negative effects on our emotional health. You can also expect to find that your practice of religion mm -hmm. will go down a big 50%. Mm -hmm. So there's spiritual health problems, emotional health problems, but then you have to say, well, why? Why, why is that the case? And tell the truth that the modal range of number of sexual partners is between um, you know, a 100 to 500 sexual partners over a lifetime with a median of 300. That you should say that monogamy after seven years uh, is almost uh, non-existent. And, and you should say that the average uh, tr uh, life uh, span of a long-term relationship is 1.5 years. It's almost a transactional relationship. Now, what's the problem with that? This should be explained to the students that, that if you're doing this, your focus is on you know the, the, this kind of external pleasure and this kind of ecstasy but there's no emotional intimacy coming mm -hmm. there there's no commitment to the other human being you're moving from one human being to another human being no monogamy that commitment mm -hmm. though is what produces that self-sacrificial generativity that's the real substance of marriage that's the real thing that produces you know true love where you know somebody is willing to make sacrifices is willing to to uh, you know, accept and, and help people even in their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, by doing this, there becomes this mutual support of one another that makes a very mm -hmm. stable household for children. So all of these things are, you know, are present if we follow the Lord's advice. But if we're not mm -hmm. doing that, if we're moving into this lifestyle, this is not healthy. Right. Now, you know, should we point this out to kids? If we don't, we're crazy. I mean, I mean, why are you going to let them go into the darkness? Why are you going to let them go into this protracted, you know, and terrible decline in emotional health w without any warning whatsoever? Why are you let letting them go into, a, you know, a protracted decline in spiritual uh, health and, and in their relationship with God? I mean, a, a decline of 50 percent, that's enormous uh, decline. Why would you do this? And, and by the way, it's broken down. Down by the Pew survey and you know in five different levels and I'm not making up these statistics as I said these come from the archives of general right. psychiatry I'm just giving what is already out and public uh, in in the good right. you know uh, science-based and right. medically based journals so the the point is is uh, I think we should right. present these things and so right. I've, I've written a curriculum right. which I hope to have out at the end of this year maybe in 2022 to bring to the juniors, right. not just for a gay lifestyle, not just for transgender, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, confusion, but also for pornography, right. uh, also for cohabitation, for premarital sex. I just want the mm -hmm. emotional and spiritual consequences of these things uh, right. to be known, and of course for abortion. Right. I mean, which is oh man, is that a 
uh, you know, and physician assisted suicide. I mean, and the list goes on. Yeah, it's but amazing. The, the point isn't it? is, uh, it's amazing <laughs> yeah. how the statistics back up the teachings of the church. Absolutely. And the church, the church's <laughs> teachings aren't built on the statistics. The statistics yeah. show you that the teaching is true, right? That's correct. Right. In fact, of course, the teachings ultimately come from Jesus and from the scriptures. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, like St. Paul, etc. So the, mm. the key point uh, that we're, uh, we're trying to make here is that, yes, those statistics right. show you that what Jesus taught about love and how important love is, of course, to our spiritual health, mm -hmm. but also to emo our emotional health. When our spiritual health is suffering, our emotional health is going to be suffering. Uh, and that's why you can mm -hmm. expect the increase in depression, the increase in anxiety, the increase in suicidal contemplation, the increase in actual suicides, the, the steep increases in right. substance abuse and, and panic disorders, etc. So the main thing is, yes, they of course they follow hand in hand. And that verifies mm -hmm. in turn, you know, that the findings right. of the American Psychiatric Association with respect to non-religious affiliation. People who have no religious affiliation feel significantly higher rates of depression and anxiety, suicidal ideation, suicides themselves, substance abuse, familial tensions, antisocial aggressivity. You know, again, right. emotional health following spiritual health and emotional decline following spiritual decline. Right. And they're all related to these moral issues that are so called controversial moral issues today but they're not uh, i mean if you look at the statistics right, sh they shouldn't be controversial the right. at all you said they shouldn't be controversial and to be fair to teachers i kind of alluded uh, last week to copping out and i want to go back on one level and say a lot of times these teachers they may believe it they might want to teach the truth like you said but they're trying to be mm -hmm. sympathetic or even more they yeah. don't want to be accused of being you know bigoted mm -hmm. yeah. or uh, yeah. intolerant and they don't have the mm -hmm. backing or the support maybe of the rest of mm -hmm. the school or the principal and so for parents as mm -hmm. we're seeing I think elsewhere quite honestly on the critical race theory mm -hmm. uh, issues that are out mm -hmm. there about in schools parents are standing up and so the parents mm -hmm. have to stand up yeah. themselves and demand that the truth be taught right yeah <clears throat> and that's why as I said I'm I'm preparing this yeah. new curriculum um, uh, this new, uh, not curriculum, but this new program for junior, second semester junior year when moral theology is taught in the bishop's curricular right. framework. I'm, I'm doing it because I just think the teachers need to be able to just, just say, here are the secular studies. I'm mm -hmm. not giving you anything that's not in the archive of general psychiatry right. or the Pew survey data or this kind of data or that kind of data or Harvard University study, Stanford University, American Psychiatric Association study, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So our, 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 my point is just simply to say, right. really point out the dangers of this and you can always tell when there's spiritual dangers uh, not just by looking at the Pew survey for you know the decline in spiritual life of people who practice these lifestyles mm -hmm. but also uh, looking at you know the decline in emotional health mm -hmm. because I'm telling you where you have radical declines in emotional health there's also concomitantly a radical decline in spiritual health and vice versa so um, and when you Satan have a, a can't be far from all of this and that's why that's we're talking correct. about Jesus' victory over Satan. But we're talking yeah. about the, the temptation in the desert as we get into the last <laughs> right. 10 minutes of the show to talk about right. the book. And you say here on the top of page 95, we might begin by asking why the Father's will is for Jesus to keep his fast for more than 40 days. And then you talk about something about Jesus fasting, maybe redeeming the sins of Israel. Yeah, well, that's the, the whole point of Jesus. Uh, remember your mother's mm -hmm. good old expression, offer it up? Mm -hmm. well, at least that was my mother's expression. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, why, why, why do I have to fast again? Well, offer it up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's good for, you know, the people around you and offer it up for the family and offer it up for those who are in need. Okay, mom, I got it, I got it. But, you know, the point is she was absolutely right. And, of course, Jesus is the prime example of this. He's not just uh, uh, using this uh, sense of self-offering 
uh, by fasting uh, on this level, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, to the Father uh, here in this context, but even on the cross when he's dying, as he's uh, reciting Psalm 22, remember? Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sabachthani, you know, that my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But that's really about Psalm 22, and what that psalm is is a self-offering. And so in that psalm, uh, he's making a self-offering to the Father so that um, we might be redeemed, not just the Jewish people, but the Gentile people, not just the people of the present age, but also the people of the future age and the past age. So uh, the objective then <clears throat> of Jesus is to make a self-offering. And of course, St. Paul recognizes this in the letter to the Colossians, right? I, I consider it, you know, uh, uh, you know, good that, that uh, you know, um, there, that there was something lacking, you know, uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the sufferings of Christ. Yeah. He doesn't mean ontologically lacking in those sufferings, yeah. but he says, I, I can actually count my sufferings in. Yeah. I have a place. My sufferings have a place. Yeah. I can be a co-offerer of uh, my suffering along with the sufferings of Christ because he's made room for me to do this. He hasn't uh, sort of taken the whole thing mm -hmm. uh, onto himself and said, no need for you, Spitzer, to have any part, you know, mm -hmm. but in, indeed he says, please have a part. I want you to be a part of this. So all of that, um, uh, you know, when you consider it, yes, Jesus is definitely every single thing he goes through is a self-offering for humanity mm -hmm. and the cross and his death are that self-offering par excellence. Uh, down towards the bottom of that page, same page you say and I thought this was interesting as it relates a lot to today we see in this passage the deceit and cunning of the devil his ability to quote scripture and to make disobedience mm -hmm. seem like adherence and then you have a, in a bracketed quote of St. Paul talking about and, and angel coming as an angel of light. That's yeah, a real problem exactly. today, isn't it? It really is. And uh, I, there is so much confusion. I mean, talk about propaganda in the culture to make black look like white and white look like black. It, it, it's just incessant. As I said, you know, when, when you really get down to it, you, you wonder why it is that the culture never talks about, uh, for example, all that mm -hmm. stuff I just talked about in terms of gay lifestyle, mm -hmm. or you know, when I talked about transgender, um, you know, when you get the uh, sex change, for example, you have a staggering 19 times increase in suicides. Why isn't that being brought out in the same moment when all of this conduct is being justified, not only on movies, but is actually justified in every kind of little hint that you can get, uh, you know, from a news broadcast yeah. or from, you know, uh, uh, Face the Nation or whatever, you know, right, some, right. you know, show that, that should be objectively uh, trying to, to give good advice to people. But, I mean, black is white and white is black. So we face this mm -hmm. constantly. And if something looks good, it's being presented to us as if it's something good. And remember Gordon Gecko in Wall Street, mm -hmm. you know, gentlemen, greed, for lack of a better term, is good. Mm -hmm. And here's all the good things that it does. So he's going to give us that package uh, gift wrapped mm -hmm. so that we can rationalize our way right into doing it. And that's what we have to remember. Everything we hear on the television, everything we learn, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in, in a school, everything that we're reading uh, in, in a popular journal, right. you know, that doesn't have studies backing it up, you know, these things are, are, can be exceedingly deceptive. They can be no better than Gordon Gecko saying that greed is good. Right. Look at all the good that it does for the economy. Look at how it winnows down, you know, inefficient industries. <clears throat> Look at what it does to liberate the soul to go for the highest limits, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, he who dies with the most toys wins, as they used to say <clears throat> in the 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I would think also with that, we've also dealing out in, in the media and also just in the Christian world, this kind of, you know, distorted Christian tolerance and understanding and 
that that makes it difficult as well. They make it sound like these things you should be acceptable because people just love each other or because you know <clears> you can't <throat> be intolerant and d diversity on these things is is a good thing. Yeah, I remember once I was in a debate with uh, <clears throat> a Unitarian minister when I was fighting um, a physician-assisted suicide back in the state of Washington. And he turned to me and he said, Bob, I mean, we both agree that love is the answer. And I said, well, yes, Ralph, we, we do agree on that, but it all depends on what you mean by love. Mm -hmm. And this is the primary confusion. The notion of love has been attacked and re-attacked. <clears throat> it's been reduced to a feeling, uh, not just a, a feeling, but it's been reduced to being nice uh, all the time. And, and, and nice is not love. Mm. Love seeks the good of the other. And if being nice actually lets another human being fall into spiritual depravity, emotional, uh, you know, sickness, and, and a variety of other terrible consequences. For example, the undermining of marriage or the undermining uh, of, of satisfaction within the marriage, the undermining of the family itself, the undermining of a sense of, of real responsibility and collaboration to the community and the society. All these things, if, if by allowing and by being nice, Mm -hmm. I'm doing these things, I mean, uh, you know, automatically, uh, you know, there's something sick, there's something wrong with this. You, you got to, that's not love. Love is doing the good for the other. The, love is trying to prevent evil from happening to the other. Mm -hmm. Love is trying to prevent uh, somebody from falling into darkness. Love is trying to get to the point of building up the community with resp uh, responsible and generative and good activity and responsible and generative, you know, a practice of sexuality within marriage and commitment, etc. All of these things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, deal with love, deal with commitment, deal with self-discipline, deal with always looking for the good of the other, the, the, the long-term good beyond just being nice, etc. And, and then, you know, when we really look, uh, you know, to it, you know, that great contribution we have been given by contemporary culture to reinterpret the golden rule treat others as they want to be treated right. you know i think we were asked that question three right. four weeks ago absolutely whatever it was right. yeah. and of course it's just nonsense it's absolutely nonsense you know somebody says well i'd like to be treated uh, like um, you know somebody who's a hedonistic um, I idiot okay uh, if that's the way you want to be treated love says i should do so uh, let me promote your hedonism. Let me promote your, uh, you know, your suicidal urge. Mm. Uh, let me support you in your homicidal desires. Mm. Uh, let me go ahead and just say, you know, honestly, uh, y y you want to commit suicide? Well, I, you know, I guess, you know, y you know that that's great. That's your freedom. Let me support you in that. I mean, uh, what are we doing? I mean, mm. it's just like th this is complete nonsense. Uh, of course we don't want to treat others the way they want to be treated. We want to treat others in a way that will be good for them, that will advance right. them, that will help them, that will build them up, that will move them from level one and level two superficiality to level three and level four profundity and eventually into eternal salvation through the purification of their love. That's what we want to do. And, and so the whole idea is love has been corrupted. Mm -hmm. And that love being turned into, you know, being nice or uh, an emotional, you know, I feel so good about this, mm -hmm. you know, which is the problem with emotivism and situationism anyway. You know, what's in a feeling? <laughs> well, a lot of deceptions are in a feeling. It could be authentic, mm -hmm. but it might not be authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be just self-promoting. Right. Believe me, from, uh, from experience, I know what a self-promoting feeling is, mm -hmm. and I practice it all the time, but are all feelings good? No, all feelings are not good. Narcissistic feelings are not good, but you could say it's a really good feeling. You know, it is a good feeling, but it's not good for you or anybody else around you as you drive everyone crazy. You know, power-hungry feelings, you know, you can say, I'm right. satiating all my desires for power 
and domination. Uh, well, I feel good about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course you feel good about it, but nobody else does. Right. And eventually, of course, you know, pride goes uh, before uh, destruction and a haughty heart before the fall. Absolutely. Enough said. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. You get hooked on a feeling, as the old song said years yeah. ago. And the other thing yeah. was, I always think of that when, when you talk about nice, is uh, in, a, in a musical, Into the Woods, when the, the Little Red Riding yeah. Hood uh, goes through our adventures and, and they ask her what her lessons she learned. She said, you know, yeah. nice is different than good. That's what she Yeah. Learned. Oh, I wish I had seen yeah, that, right. but so, um, that's you know, exactly correct. Right, exactly. <laughs> so if you'll uh, yeah. give us your blessing on the way out the door, Father. Oh, absolutely. And bow your head to pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord of all wisdom, the Lord who desires your good with all of the intensity of his heart, the Lord that desires your eternal joy with him in that eternal love which is good, may that Lord's blessing be upon you, drawing you into the fullness of life and holiness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. We shall see you next time. Stay well. And remember all of Father Spitzer's books, including his latest one, all available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Next week, we will continue on in the desert. And of course, don't forget about EWTN's bookmark. It's a really good one. Not the interview, but the book is Prison Journal, Volume 2, The State Court Rejects the Appeal by His Eminence George Cardinal Pell. There's a lot of spiritual insights in these books. It's not just a journal the way you would think. So you check that out. Also, we've got Unipero Serra, A Man of God, A Mission of Love, Thursday, July 1st. You can look for that coming up here on EWTN, Called and Chosen, Father Vincent Capadano, Sunday, July 4th, honoring, obviously, the United States' birth on uh, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Wonderful production of EWTN. Check that out. And look for Father Spitzer and I next time at the intersection of faith and reason. Hopefully next week, we'll see you then.